Thank you, Eileen. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for uh, braving a, uh, a challenging uh, set of parking. Uh, you, you know, it's uh, uh, not easy, but you, you showed a lot of commitment, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so welcome to the, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute uh, course on the history of African Americans in Nashville. Uh, I'm Dan Sharfstein. I'm uh, delighted to be with you here on this uh, beautiful morning uh, in this beautiful room. Mm -hmm. uh, I was last in the temple uh, yesterday uh, during Yom Kippur. Uh, so if you hear my stomach growling, uh, it, it's just, you know, my memory of, of yesterday. Uh, so uh, we're really grateful to the folks at, uh, at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute for making this course possible, uh, particularly Norma Clippard and, and Chandra Allison. Uh, and then we're, we're just grateful to all of you too. Uh, really, what, what an amazing turnout. Uh, so today, uh, Dr. Williams and I will spend a couple of minutes uh, briefly introducing ourselves and our interest in the subject. Uh, and then we'll take a few minutes to explore the, the subjects we'll be covering in the course uh, class by class. Uh, and then um, uh, we'll take a, a few minutes to consider uh, why uh, now seems like a particularly important time for, for Nashville to be thinking about its African-American past. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll uh, get going. Um, so first, uh, just a couple of introductions. Uh, Lee, do, do you want to start? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I am honored for this privilege to speak to you about um, Black Nashville. Um, first, a little bit about myself. I come from a family of storytellers. A lot of times the stories might have been questionable, but nevertheless, they were, they were stories. Um, I, I first taught this class at TSU in 2010, and it was part of uh, another project I was working on. For, for those of y'all that are familiar with Jefferson Street, you know where the underpass is, the Gateway to Heritage Project, I was involved in that. Um, just the Tennessee State part of it, but I wanted to make sure that it was done, done well. So I was able to get a tour of Jefferson Street from a guy who's still around, Kwame Lillard. Uh, he gave my class and I a tour of Jefferson Street and, and we walked and we talked and we asked questions and then once we got back to TSU and I tried to debrief the students on what they saw, um, they asked me questions about Nashville that I could not answer. As a grad student, I studied the Nashville movement. So I was familiar with Diane Nash and James Lawson and Bernard Lafayette and all these guys. But then the students began asking me questions about the folks on the margins, if you will. So if you're familiar with this area, the folks on Jackson Street on Hyman Street. And I really didn't know the answer to these questions. So what we did, and it was kind of slick move as a professor, I said, we're gonna, we'll find out together. <laughs> um, so we started um, what became known as the North Nashville Heritage Project. And it was important for me as a professor to tell the story through the eyes of the African Americans that experienced it. So I thought about it, I was like, okay, well I can create a class where we try to do the same thing with the history of Nashville from the start to the day before yesterday. So what I will present to you, and I'm sure my colleague will as well, um, we'll, we'll try to discuss the history of this city through the eyes of African Americans. And it oftentimes means looking at the history from the margins, looking at the history that has been celebrated and 
the history that has been erased. I know we aren't supposed to give you guys homework assignments, but I'm kind of a rule breaker. I'm going to give you one anyway. Um, when you're out and about over the next week, take a look around and see how many statues or monuments we have to black women in this city. And um, I don't know, I think I can identify three, but maybe I'm not, I'm not from Nashville, so I don't know all of the corners of the cities, but um, think about that and, and, and ask yourselves why, because we've had some amazing, amazing black women in this city. I'm gonna talk about a few. Um, think about the movements that have been separate, that have been discussed. And then the people that we have not explored in these movements. Everybody knows about the civil rights movement, right? And we kind of do. Um, but do you know the role that maybe the bookies on Jefferson Street played in the movement? Or the little old lady who fried chicken in the Baptist churches, what role she played? So um, this is how, um, at least on the days that I'll be up front, um, we'll, we'll explore this together. And I'm looking forward to um, taking this journey with you. Well, uh, th thank you, Lee. Uh, so I teach law and history at Vanderbilt, and I write about race and citizenship uh, with a particular focus on reconstruction and its aftermath. Uh, and I teach courses on property law and on American legal history. Uh, and for many years, I taught a seminar on the legal history of slavery, segregation, and civil rights in the United States. Now, students would come to me. They had to write a 30, 40-page paper. Uh, and they would say, what should we write about? And I would say, uh, well, there has to be original archival research. Uh, it's a relatively short semester. So you know, I suggest that you uh, think local. Uh, and a lot of the papers that my students wrote wound up exploring a, a huge range of uh, Nashville history topics. And they were based on a really wonderful archives uh, at the Nashville Public Library and the Davidson County Archives, uh, at the Tennessee State Library and Archives, at Fisk and TSU. And I found those papers uh, really interesting, not just in terms of the topics and you know, what they taught us about uh, you know, slavery, about uh, liberty, about equality, uh, about civil rights activism, about uh, uh, the role of, of courts uh, all, all through uh, African American history in Nashville. Uh, but also, I found it particularly interesting uh, to see how students could uh, contribute uh, to this uh, area of study uh, in an, a very direct and immediate way. Uh, you, you know, the work that my students were doing struck me as uh, uh, original and important, uh, and it just uh, it showed me, uh, introduced me not just to uh, the wonderful work that's already being done uh, in Nashville history, uh, but also uh, the work that uh, it, you know, continues uh, to, to be done. So when the opportunity arose a few years ago to teach an undergraduate course called Historic Black Nashville uh, with another historian, Jane Landers, uh, I jumped at the chance. Uh, I'm about to teach it for the third time this spring. Uh, and in preparing to teach the course, uh, it was important to get to know the community of people inside and, and out of academia uh, who are all contributing uh, to, to really what's a collective enterprise uh, in, in Nashville history. And, you know, to, and really no one is, is doing more in recovering Nashville history and, and bringing it uh, into the public consciousness uh, than, than Dr. Williams. So it's really a thrill and a, a privilege for me uh, to teach this course uh, uh, with him. So we have six classes together. Right, from today until uh, the middle of November. And Dr. Williams and I will basically alternate doing most of the talking in, in any given week. 
uh, and we'll always leave time uh, for questions at the end, uh, although periodically we'll, we'll uh, you know, we, we might slow things down and, and uh, uh, make sure that, that we're, we're connecting with you all. Uh, and, uh, you know, the history of African Americans in Nashville covers a relatively long time span, right, from the 1780s, uh, you know, into uh, the uh, 1960s and beyond. Right, um, but we're also covering a, a big range of substantive issues. Uh, so our class meetings will, will move roughly chronologically, uh, but they'll also focus on specific themes. So today we're starting at uh, the, the very uh, beginning of uh, you know, what the, the settlement that became Nashville. Uh, you know, starting with the Middle Tennessee frontier uh, in the late 18th century, uh, as Nashville evolves from being uh, a fortified position on the Cumberland, uh, you, you know, basically for the farmers who were scattered across the area, uh, to being a trading center, county seat, center of population, uh, really an established city. Uh, now, next week, uh, we'll focus on the experience of enslavement uh, in the city in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, it's uh, different from slavery on the frontier, uh, but it's not always the, uh, the stereotype of plantation slavery, uh, even in places like Belmede, uh, where, you know, on Belmede Plantation, where, where this temple is built. Uh, Nashville's a city, uh, so there are all kinds of different trades, all kinds of different ways of living, uh, often uh, uh, you know, much more uh, independent and autonomous living. Uh, Nashville's a river port uh, with lines of news and information that extend from Canada to the Caribbean. Uh, so there's a much more politically aware community um, than we might otherwise think, uh, many more opportunities to uh, meet and talk with outsiders, uh, and then more opportunities to escape, more opportunities to resist uh, than we might think uh, might exist otherwise uh, outside of cities. Now, historians might describe the, uh, the complexity of slave experience uh, what they might call the, the contingent status of the category slave, right? It's not just one thing, uh, one role that's mandated by law, right? It's something that gets defined through practice, right? And it's something that gets defined through experience. Uh, but, you know, even as the experience is complex, Right? Even as the experience of slavery is, is varied and diverse, uh, even as white people can see African Americans doing all kinds of things that suggest the injustice and cruelty of slavery, Nashville, uh, its, its white residents, its economy, its political institutions remain deeply invested in and committed to the institution of slavery, uh, and to the internal slave trade. In our third meeting, uh, two weeks from now, we'll talk about how African Americans in Nashville define freedom. Uh, just as historians might say that slavery is a uh, contingent experience, a contingent status, uh, so is freedom, right? What does freedom mean? Uh, it, you know, it's something that has to be hashed out in real time. So as uh, the historian Leon Litwack has written, you know, the key question is not so much whether someone is free, but rather it's how free is free, right? There have been free African Americans in Nashville as long as Nashville has existed. And African Americans have struggled to define and to claim their freedom 
well before the Civil War uh, and emancipation. So this class, the, our third class together, will consider the, the free experience uh, before, during, and after the Civil War. Now our fourth class uh, will examine African American cultural and religious institution building uh, with a focus uh, on the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, and for many reasons, Nashville emerged after the Civil War as a center of black business and cultural life. And many of the institutions that African American Nashvilleans are uh, built uh, are still around and continue to play a really important role uh, in the life of the city. Our fifth class will examine African American education. You know, another story of enduring institution building despite hostile neighbors and a discriminatory state. Right, Nashville's black universities have had an enormous outsize impact on African American communities around the country, but also more generally uh, on how we study African and African American history and culture. And our final class explores what historians call the long civil rights movement in Nashville. Uh, it's not just about the 1950s and 1960s, uh, but it's uh, a movement that has roots that go deep into the Jim Crow era and extend well past the 60s. There's a lot of public memory and you know, a, a large degree of celebration of the sit-ins, of the freedom rides, uh, but the civil rights movement, it's important to remember, it didn't take place in a vacuum. Right? The civil rights movement flourished in Nashville not only because of the concentration of students here, but also because the city had long intergenerational traditions of activism, uh, and those traditions continue to be important today. So those are our, our roughly uh, our six classes together. Uh, and before we start talking about uh, the frontier and the settlement of, of uh, Middle Tennessee, uh, by Europeans and, and uh, by Africans. I, I want to just take a few minutes to uh, just explore a, a, an issue that I think will be uh, something that we keep coming back to uh, in our time together. Uh, and that is um, uh, the question of why it's so important today to study the, the history of African Americans in Nashville. It's a history that is uh, deeply personal Right for hundreds of thousands of Nashvilleans. And it's a huge part of the history of the city generally. Right, It's all of our history. And if we want to know how the city became what it is today, we have to understand what slavery, what emancipation, the rise of a, a strong, prosperous, and activist African American community, uh, what the emergence of Jim Crow segregation, uh, what uh, the civil rights movement has contributed, uh, have contributed to our, our city, right? making it what it is today. Uh, Nashville's history tells an essential history, not just of race in America, uh, but it's also uh, uh, an important part of the history of racism in America. And when I think about why this history matters. I, I think about uh, the incredible changes the city has undergone in the 12 plus years that, that I've been here. You know, if we think about, uh, you know, if we look at the Nashville skyline today, um, what's the, the defining feature uh, of, of our skyline? Yeah, cranes, right? Um, uh, I think, you know, starting in maybe 2014, 2015, I feel like every year has been proclaimed the year of the crane, right? And um, 
Uh, and there are always stories about, you know, the number of cranes in Nashville outnumber this city, that city, this city combined, or uh, we're running out of cranes, uh, or we've run out of cranes and people have to get their cranes from Louisville, right? It's a lot of, lot of crane talk. And, you know, it's a, it's a sign, right, that so much of the city is being knocked down, right? So much of the city is being dug up. So much of the city is being paved over, right? That Nashville often looks like a city without a history, right? It's a, a city where, uh, you know, you might see a historical marker, right, with the outlines of a house, right? But then behind it's a Walgreens, right? And you just can't quite make the, the connection, right? We live in a city where every neighborhood right, is being gentrified at the same time, right? And it's a city where, you know, the markets for land and for housing, right, are, are just, are, are bonkers, right? And, and they're, uh, you know, in such play right now that they've set all kinds of long-established communities adrift. So, you know, here in Nashville, we're, we're tall, right, we're skinny, but maybe we're not that deep, right? As thousands of people are set in motion, you know, as Nashville's oldest continuous communities are dispersed and, and bulldozed and just made unrecognizable, I think it's worth asking, are there any values that should guide us, right, as a city? Right, that should guide our, our policies uh, beyond supply and demand. Right? What do we lose when we erase and displace uh, communities that have been essential to making Nashville what it is right, and what it's always been? Right? When we start calling Edge Hill the, the South Gulch, Right? Or uh, when, um, you know, when we take St. Cloud Hill, right, one of the birthplaces of black freedom, right? And, uh, you know, can, th this is uh, the view from uh, Fort Negley looking northeast. Right? And if we take that and, you know, we, uh, you know, make it a, uh, or propose to make it a great place to, to live and work and do yoga. <laughs> right, what do we lose? Right, what do we lose if, you know, what we're doing today compounds and reinforces policies from earlier eras that were intentionally racist? And by looking at our past, I think it's a way for us to gain a little more control over how we think about, conceive of, and manage what our future as a city could and should be. Right? Often there, there are so many moments right, in these past years when it seems like we're, you know, nobody has any control over how uh, you know, how this boulder is rolling down the mountain, right? And I wonder if uh, uh, the past can be useful to us, you know, not so much in determining exactly what course we should take, right? But in just setting some, some parameters, right? Setting some, some uh, ethical guideposts for where we should go. Now, Now here's at least part of Nashville's skyline today, uh, uh, courtesy of the Wiki Commons. And here's the, the it's hard to see, we, we have so much beautiful light, uh, but here's the, the plan for, for Nashville in 1789, right? And you know, if we think about what Nashville was for a very long time, uh, you know, it was basically downtown and, you know, what, what's now called uh, Sobro, 
right? And 1789, this map, uh, you know, Nashville at that point was 10 years old, right? It, you know, the beginning of Nashville as a city, right, really uh, dates back to 1779. Right, when uh, uh, James Robertson and eight others uh, arrived in territory claimed by uh, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Shawnee peoples. And the Robertson party uh, you know, stopped around here right, on the bluffs above the Cumberland. And they cleared fields for corn, uh, they uh, built a stockade, right, what became uh, uh, Fort Nashboro. And, you know, there's, there's uh, some excellent work on uh, uh, early Nashville by uh, Anita Goodstein and, and uh, Bobby Lovett, among, among others, right, and uh, after the Robertson Party uh, came here, uh, very quickly, uh, more settlers started coming, uh, including, you know, in, in the months after the Robertson Party, a, uh, uh, a large group uh, who traveled by water, right, in like 40 plus boats, uh, led by uh, John Donaldson, right? We think, you know, Robertson, Donaldson, we see these names, right, on our, our streets. And, you know, the settlers, they, I mean, there, there was no, uh, they, they didn't come here to uh, cluster in a city, right? It's not like, uh, you know, the people who are moving to Nashville today, right, who, who are, uh, you know, want to be uh, as close to the center as possible so they can, you know, ride their scooters to wherever. Right? Instead, you know, what brought them to Nashville was, uh, you know, they wanted land, right? The whole game was land. And land uh, meant, uh, you know, independence, right? If you owned land, if you could make a crop, right, you wouldn't have to depend on anyone, right? This is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why uh, you know, at least initially, democracy in America was, uh, you know, it was viewed, the ideal citizen was thought of as uh, uh, independent yeoman farmers, right? Because they couldn't necessarily be bought and sold by anybody. They, they supported themselves, right? But land could also be a vehicle uh, uh, towards, you know, not just subsistence, but, but enduring wealth, right? People wanted land. People wanted to get rich. And so people uh, came to the Nashville area, and then they sort of fanned out over about 100 miles. Right? And there were just lots of scattered settlements uh, in, in this area. And from the beginning, right, this was a world that African Americans encountered right, and, uh, uh, and helped build. Right? So, one of the members of Robertson's party uh, was a slave named Robert. Right? There were uh, many African Americans in the Donaldson flotilla. And the early settlers of Nashville didn't just include people who were held as slaves. Right? There were free people of color among the settlers as well. And you know, we, we have uh, fleeting references to their names in, in various records, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, Abraham and Sam and Aaron and Sylvia and you know, John Civil, right? There's, uh, and now, most of the settlers, you know, white and black, right, were coming from parts east, Virginia, North Carolina, and elsewhere. Right? There, there was uh, one free man of color who um, uh, was from Pennsylvania, uh, had fought in the Revolutionary War, right? and this is where he came to, to get land. 
And by the 1780s, by the 1790s, those more settled places in the East were not frontiers. And so coming to this part of the world, right, crossing the Appalachians, meant a big change. So what did it mean to be on the frontier? Right, I want us to, to you know, take some time at least to, to think about you know, what frontier life was like. Right? And there's a lot, of, you know, a lot of ways we can romanticize frontier life and you know, every now and then you're driving, you know, you're, you're driving on uh, uh, Charlotte or, uh, and, and you see a, um, a log house, right? And you think, oh, you know, those were the days, <laughs> right? But, you know, it's worth thinking, what did it mean to be on the frontier? And how would the frontier be different uh, through African-American eyes, right? Whether uh, they were held as, whether people were held as slaves or were legally classified as free. Now, let, let me start by, by just thinking about the frontier experience for free people of color. So for free people of color, uh, the frontier often meant uh, opportunity, right? It often meant freedom. Uh, it meant the uh, opportunity to, to uh, fashion one's own life, right? In a way that was just much harder to do in settled areas, right? Settled areas that were wedded to uh, the institution of slavery, wedded to white supremacy, right? Where any representation of an alternative to, to slavery uh, had to be constricted as much as possible, right? So in places like Virginia and North Carolina and elsewhere, right, it was uh, very difficult for African Americans to uh, acquire land, very difficult to pass wealth along from one generation to the next, uh, very difficult to you know, do things like um, uh, own guns, right, which uh, uh, was another key to an independent livelihood, right, and not just uh, personal security. And you know, for much of the 18th century, right, as laws were passed uh, sort of limiting and narrowing the possibilities for free people of color, many families were just set in motion by those laws. So people who, you know, the largest community of free people of color was in Virginia, right? And, uh, you know, almost uh, from the beginning uh, in the 17th century. And Virginia families moved into North Carolina and South Carolina. They moved to the back country of those colonies. They moved into the hills, right? We see from these early free families of color the origins of uh, Melungeon communities in eastern Tennessee, among others. And on the frontier, people could find land, right, to be had. Often frontier areas were looking for people to take land, right? So African Americans could buy land on the frontier. On the frontier, African Americans could be part of communities that of necessity couldn't afford to define people as outsiders so much by the color of their skin, right? And this is economic necessity because everyone on the frontier is taking a massive economic gamble, right? And they need each other. But it's also physical security, right? In a place where, you know, settlers are occupying land over which native people still claim sovereignty. But being able to own land, right, for, for free people of color, uh, and, you know, for, for white settlers too, it meant being able to gain wealth, gain allies, gain a secure social position, 
or alternatively, it meant maybe they would just have the freedom to be left alone. And you know, you see this on frontiers in the Carolinas in the early 18th century. You know, you see it in uh, Tennessee in the late 18th century and early 19th century as free people of color settle here. But you see it even later also, you know, in places like California, right, during, during the gold rush in the mid-19th century, or you see it in Kansas, right, or you see it in uh, Colorado in the late 19th century during the silver rush, right? Frontiers could mean just a, a, a different level of freedom and equality. Now, for people who are held as slaves, Frontier life could have many edges. So on one hand, the, the kinds of interactions that, uh, that African Americans held as slaves could have with white people were often different on the frontier than what they were like in more regimented and disciplined plantation areas. So, you know, we could uh, just take a look at Fort Nashboro again. Uh, and uh, now, ha have, uh, have any of you been to Fort Nashboro? Yeah, and uh, uh, you, did you wear yourself out walking in Fort Nashboro? <laughs> no, right? It's not the Tower of London. Right? And so, you know, we look at Fort Nashboro and, wow, Right? It, it's a pretty intimate scale. Right? And if you're living there, there are not a lot of places you can go. Right? So in much of the frontier, whites and blacks were working in very close quarters. Right? I think uh, it was the historian Ira Berlin who uh, talking about 17th century Virginia, uh, you, you know, talked about everyone working shoulder to shoulder, right, regardless of race, regardless of, of status as free or slave. And the result of those daily interactions, in at least some cases, could be less formality, right, fewer strict rules, right, just a, a little more autonomy. Right, because you know, everyone is kind of governed by the same constraints. And in those conditions, those close quarters, those conditions of intimacy, there were more opportunities that might present themselves for negotiation. Right? White slave owners on the frontier uh, were risking their lives, risking their fortunes, and the logic of survival, right, may have given, you know, the men and women in bondage knew what uh, the people who were holding them were risking, right? So the logic of survival may have given them some room to negotiate their status, right? And in Nashville, you know, you do see in the history of Nashville some evidence of people who could negotiate better packages for themselves right, as slaves, right, and often they were able to negotiate pathways to freedom. So one celebrated case is, um, it involves a man named Robert Renfro, right, who was claimed as property uh, by a settler named Robert Searcy, and Renfro was able to make a deal with him and it was a deal that was ratified in the county court in 1794. If you think it's ratified in the court, that means you know, there are people in his cor corner advocating for him. And the deal was that he could work on his own. Right? And uh, what work did he do? Uh, he was allowed to sell liquor and food. And within seven years, right, being able to work on your own, it means you can make money, 
right? And it also means that you can gain clients, right? You can gain allies. And so seven years, 1801, Renfro had made enough money and he had enough customers with clout in this little frontier town that prominent residents were petitioning the state legislature for his freedom. And his freedom was granted, right? And into the 1820s, he owned a, a tavern on the public square, right, and, and in a, a stable, right? And it was on land that he bought from Circe. And Renfro was you know, not alone in being able to, to hire out his time, right? Uh, he, you know, spend most days unsupervised, you know, keep money that they earned, right? There, he, and uh, there were men, right, who were able to, to uh, gain this relative autonomy, uh, and women too, you know, as washerwomen, right, as uh, launderers, Right, and then eventually uh, as, as uh, shopkeepers too. So on one hand, you know, the frontier, there's maybe a little less discipline, right? The status of slave is a little more fluid and negotiable. But on the other hand, frontier life could also be very harsh. Everyone was risking their lives by, by trespassing on native land, right? It wasn't like, you know, particularly in the early days, it wasn't like people were going onto, land, onto this land uh, with a, uh, you know, having strong negotiations with the local tribes or with some kind of explicit state mandate, right? Instead, there was a a uh, private company that had negotiated some vague treaty, right, with uh, some group of Cherokees, right, and it was on this kind of very flimsy paper basis, right, that, that Robertson and, and his ilk were able to, to come here and make their claims. So everyone was risking their lives because they were trespassing. And until the mid-1790s, there were regular fights with, with Cherokees and Creeks and, uh, you, you know, on the way here, uh, you, you know, there are reports of battles with the Chickamaugas. And one of the few places where you see African Americans mentioned by name in the historical record is when people are reported killed by Indians. Right? So, Robert, who is one of the original Nashville settlers, right, with the Robertson party, uh, was killed in 1781. And others were kidnapped and captured, right? Some wound up finding their way back to the Nashboro settlement and other Middle Tennessee settlements, and others did not, right? So on a basic level, this was a very perilous existence. And beyond being killed right, in the war for land, in many ways what you see in Middle Tennessee anticipates, it doesn't just reflect the relative freedom of the frontier, say, in South Carolina. Instead, it anticipates what the frontier would be like in the Deep South right, in Alabama and Mississippi, uh, which were opened up to settlement from the east in the first decades of the 19th century. You know, that frontier became the occasion for what Ira Berlin called the second middle passage, right, from the east to the deep south. Uh, this is a time, the early 19th century, when more people were trafficked from their homes than during the African slave trade. So what does that mean? If we think about the way the frontier worked in Nashville in the late 18th, early 19th century, we have to think, 
most of the people, the men, the women, the children, coming here in the early days, right, most people were relatively young and most people were alone. You know, that meant, you know, if we think about people coming essentially alone, it meant they had been taken from somewhere and they had been taken from families, right? And when they were taken from their families, right, they were moved hundreds of miles away, right? Across the mountains, right? It was like being taken to another planet, right? The people coming to Nashville, they were the disappeared. And both they and the families they left behind were haunted by their absence. If we think about the slave population in this area, you know, for the first 15 years, it, it kind of rose uh, to about 1,000 enslaved people. And then by 1810, uh, more than 6,000 slaves, uh, about 40% of the population. So many single people, many people who were alone were brought here. And they were brought here, you know, young and single, in part because the work of settling was so grueling, right? Their job was to turn forest into farmland. And it's physically strenuous work, and it's economically tenuous work. So, you know, they're, they're vulnerable not just to attack, right, not just to disease, but also to physical injury and also to malnutrition. Now, more than that, uh, you know, slave owners were uh, taking a lot of risks themselves, right? And they also got sick and died or they were killed. And just the, the basic instability of life meant that people who were held as slaves constantly were faced with the prospect of having their lives being turned upside down again, right? So another place where you see African Americans in the historical record is in wills, right, in sales upon death, right? And so it's a perilous existence in that regard too. Now finally, you know, if, we, if we think a little more about the economic risks that the whole frontier enterprise represented, it meant that there were brutal business imperatives at work. You know, having a, a land getting rich in Nashville, in Middle Tennessee, in the late 18th, early 19th century, it meant this constant balancing game of land and production, right, of the cost of uh, of feeding uh, and, and caring for, you know, clothing, uh, uh, human property. It meant balancing uh, calculations. People were speculating on the markets for slaves. And so it's a world where people were very coldly, constantly buying and selling and renting and mortgaging human beings, right? There were, you know, look at the history of uh, slavery in Nashville, and a key source is the hundreds and hundreds of transactions that get recorded. And very, very few of them involve more than one person, right? So if we think about people's families are broken up in the East, they're brought here, Maybe they have some chance to reform their families. But those families were constantly getting broken up again. Now, I think I'll talk for just a few more minutes and then we can open it up to, to questions. By 1810, 
you know, the frontier is uh, uh, you know, 30 years old, right? And really, uh, uh, Nashville has become more of a settled town. It's on its way to being a city. It's a city that African Americans built, right? And it means that the experience of slavery was undergoing more transition and change, right? It's moving from a frontier footing to a very different experience, you know, the experience of urban slavery. And, you know, by 1810, you start seeing signs that uh, slavery in Nashville is becoming much more institutionalized, right? Much more formal, right? So you see, for example, a lot more lawmaking, right? That purports to regulate uh, how slavery should be practiced, what slaves can and can't do, right? And a lot of lawmaking uh, talks about uh, the ability of slaves to hire out their own work. Right? And also, a uh, lot of lawmaking targeting gatherings of African Americans. And we could see those laws and we could say, um, well, you know, I guess uh, the legislature is really tightening the screws on the African American experience and uh, maybe people can't hire out their work like they used to be able to or maybe they can't gather like maybe they would have been able to when it was a little less organized on the frontier. But what you see is the legislature keeps revisiting those issues again and again and again. And it sort of highlights, it, it, you know, it, it suggests that all of these activities just continue to go on, right? And it, it shows you know, some limits of lawmaking in a slave society, right? In, in many ways, so much of uh, the formal lawmaking is, uh, designed to uh, give the people who are claiming human property the, the right to do as much as they possibly could with, with you know, what, they were, what they claimed to own, right? And so you could think there's a lot of lawmaking, but it always ends at the property line. But, you know, we can also see it as a sign of just what life in a city could be, right? So, you know, in some ways, you know, we look at Fort Nashboro and the intimate scale, and that intimate scale is kind of reproduced block by block, right, in a, a small city. So it's not like uh, people are segregated in their daily lives, right? People are living in close quarters in the city, right? And at the same time, right, alongside this intimacy, with a larger scale, right, once you have, you know, 18,000 people in a city, there's at least some opportunity to lose oneself, right, some opportunity to be anonymous in the city. And there are, you know, not just different economic opportunities, not just different social opportunities, uh, but there's also the, the fact that, uh, you, you know, by 1810, uh, there's a critical mass of African Americans in the city, right? So we know that people can lose themselves, that people can have, carve out some independent time for themselves, and that can often mean earning money for themselves, it can often mean uh, building different kinds of networks across races that can be used to leverage oneself into freedom, right? It can also mean uh, you, you know, the, the public square on Sundays. You know, it seems like year after year after year, the legislature seems up in arms about uh, you know, just the, the uh, gatherings of African Americans in the city. And it seems like there, there are you know, important social spaces. Uh, there are, uh, you know, businesses indoors and out of doors, right, that uh, cater to this critical mass of African Americans. And so next week, uh, we'll, we'll focus uh, more on
what slavery looks like uh, in a growing city. All right, I'll stop here. Uh, and we have uh, uh, about 13 minutes or so. Uh, so if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to take them. Yes? Great. Um, so it's a question about the, the population of African Americans, uh, slave and free. So, so I think I'm, I'm uh, never the best numbers person, right? But it, you know, if we're thinking about free people of color in Nashville, uh, I think it rises from uh, you know something like. Uh, six uh, to about 200 uh, in those early frontier decades. And then there are more African Americans who uh, are recorded kind of moving through Nashville, uh, but not staying. Right? So, so that's uh, uh, one measure. Um, you, you know, for so total population by 1810 is about 18,000, right? And no, 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 no. That's the total population. But if I'm talking about the slave population, by 1810, it's about 6,000. Uh, 1795 is about 1,000. Um, you see, uh, you know, the proportion is, you know, basically goes from, uh, you, you know, it, there are times when it's, about a quarter of the population is African American to about a third to about 40%. Sometimes it's 50%, but it just kind of fluctuates. And you know, it's, it's such a dynamic time with so many people coming in, right? That that. Uh, but you know, if we're thinking, you know, we can think 40% uh, by 1810. Uh, vast majority are held in under some terms of bondage. Right, uh, you, you know, and for some people, that status there's a little room for independence, and for many people, uh, it, you know, it, it's there isn't. Is there a history of resistance in that period? Good question. Um, you see, uh, you know, it's unclear, uh, but you see that there is. Um, at least one story of a free man of color who is uh, uh, captured by, um, uh, by Native Americans. And then he comes back. And uh, there is all kind of talk, uh, although this could just be uh, you know, talk that's designed to uh, gin up more social control, but all kinds of talk that he uh, he, you know, became part of the uh, Native American community that that uh, uh, that captured him. Uh, that he fired on white people. He had to swear that he uh, had not waged war on white people. Uh, so there's at least some suspicion, right, that uh, African Americans uh, could resist, right. But you know, as a general matter, the the uh, historical record in that period is scant, right? I mean, moving into the 19th century, you definitely see uh, more accounts uh, of resistance. And the resistance takes uh, many different kinds of forms. Yes? Yeah, so, so that's a, a good question. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, you, 
question, you know, I don't know that much, but, you know, I, I certainly could um, uh, imagine, yes, sure, right? I mean, it's a, um, uh, you know, even as we say that the frontier is a little different, right? People are coming from areas where, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the social norms and etiquettes of slavery are established. Right and you know different people are uh, you know have uh, you know different uh, you know use all kinds of different modes of control, right? And to the extent that you see that there's an active market, right, for buying and selling people, right, and taking them from their families, uh, I think it, it almost you know. It's hard to imagine that there weren't, uh, you know, you know, any number of restraints and controls. You know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a gun or a whip or or uh, chains. Yes. So, it's a good question. Um, you know, I know that uh, there are lots of recorded transactions, uh, but you know, there there isn't uh, a. Uh, I mean, you know, later on in the 19th century, right? There, you yeah. Please make sure my mic is on. I was, um, I want to answer your question first, and then I'll jump on your question. Um, yes, um, slavery was able to exist in Nashville as a result of the threat of violence. So you think of the gun, the club, the whip, everything that you can conceptualize going on in Virginia happened here. We had a stockyard in the public square where folks were punished, and I'll show you next week of a slave advertisement that Andrew Jackson put out that is, is pretty brutal. Okay, and, and I'm sorry, can you repeat your question for me? Okay, I don't want to give my talk this afternoon, I, but I, 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 <laughs> um, Right from the start, Nashville was the second largest slave market, slave port in the volunteer state. So from the area that stretches from the public square to about 4th Avenue North, or 4th Avenue North intersects Charlotte, um, slave brokers lined that strip. Every Saturday from like 12 to 2 p.m., um, um, slaves would be sold on the steps of the courthouse. And we'll, we'll, we'll probe that more deeply next week. And I want to kind of get you guys to start thinking about um, the experience of the folks that were being bought and sold. And Dr. Sharfstein has talked uh, a lot about the, the interactions between um, that, that occurred in these spaces, so people being bought and sold. I wanted to try to think about that from um, the perspective of the folks that were standing on the auction blocks. Okay, all right. Thank you. Oh, good. Uh, it, you know, you think about the frontier, and there is just like frantic deal making, right? And it's land, uh, and then it's also people, and people are, are you know, are always in play in so many different forms, right? So, uh, and I, I guess, you know, we, we don't live in, I mean, the frontier in Nashville wasn't, uh, there's no Craigslist, right? So, you know, in a world where there is lots of deal making, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's going to be a market you know, it may not necessarily resemble sort of the, the classic antebellum uh, 
slave market, you know, when it's in the 1790s and there are, you know, 200 people at play, right? But, you know, it's a market. Yes? Yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely lots of uh, people with uh, uh, small slave holdings. You know, Middle Tennessee is not a place where, uh, you, you know, there, I mean, there were uh, large, uh, large-scale slaveholders, right, including, uh, you know, right here on this land, right? But uh, it was also a place where there were lots of uh, people who, uh, you know, held many fewer slaves, right? And often, uh, you know, given the, uh, the, you know, the market for human property, you know, it was often the, uh, you know, the most valuable thing people owned, right? Sort of all their money was invested. Uh, and they were, you know, not just buying and selling, but they were buying on credit, right? They were uh, renting. Right, and uh, you know this was uh, a. Uh, it's not uh, you know it's it's not gone with the wind, right? It, there there's just it's very diverse uh, how people were were owned and how they lived. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, if we think about uh, uh, the East Coast, right, very quickly, uh, you know, by mid 18th century, uh, you know, land holding is very established. Uh, it's very hard to uh, get land if you don't have land, right? And, you know, mid 18th century onward, people are coveting the land. Uh, beyond the, the Appalachians, you know, particularly uh, after the French and Indian War, right? And uh, it, you know, this land is uh, nominally under uh, British control, right? And so uh, George Washington, for example, uh, you, you know, the prospect of land beyond the Appalachians uh, was, uh, you know, at the front of his mind, right? And uh, and he actually, you know, from the beginning, uh, uh, understood that, um, uh, he, you know, he, that this would be part of uh, an independent American experience, right? Uh, uh, taking this land across the Appalachians, dispossessing the native peoples. Now, uh, colonists uh, start uh, squatting on native lands, uh, you know, trans-Appalachian lands. Uh, at the end of the 1750s, and it's a nightmare for the British Empire, right? Because uh, they may claim it on paper, but they don't have sovereignty over it. They also, uh, you know, are rely on uh, alliances with uh, native nations, right? So 1763, there's uh, uh, the Proclamation Line, right, where uh, King George bans crossing the Appalachians. Uh, and that, uh, you, you know, shapes the revolutionary consciousness of lots of people. So, uh, you, you know, free oh, um, freedom from uh, the king means freedom to take that land. Let's see, I think we're, we're 
out of time, and I think we have to stick to time. So if you have a question, I'm happy to uh, talk more in Dr. Williams, uh, too. Uh, thank you very much.